Hi everyone, welcome back to another video. Now, this week's biggest COVID related event is that the FDA authorized the new bivalent vaccine from Pfizer and Moderna, and the CDC gave their blessing to recommend the Pfizer bivalent vaccine for everybody 12 and up, and the Moderna bivalent vaccine for everybody 18 and up. Now, in my previous video, I've already summarized some of my initial thoughts and uh, CDC's recommendation, and if you have not watched that, the link is in the description box down below. And in this video, I'm going to dive deep and very deep into the benefit and risk of the new bivalent vaccine and let you decide if the authorities are eroding trust or saving the public. So let's get started. Let's have a quick recap of the events that led to the authorization and recommendation of the BA5 bivalent vaccine. On June 28th, the FDA Vaccine and Related Biological Products Advisory Committee held a meeting with the representatives from Pfizer, Moderna, and Novavax, voted to recommend the inclusion of an Omicron component for the COVID-19 booster vaccines in the U.S., including Dr. Paul Offit, two members disagree with the recommendation. FDA further specifies that the new booster vaccine should have the original and the BA5 Omicron components and not the BA1 Omicron components with an understanding that the vaccine manufacturers will not have human clinical data on the BA4-5 bivalent vaccine before the fall booster campaign. And on August 22nd and 23rd, Pfizer and Moderna separately submitted their BA45 bivalent vaccine EUA application to the FDA. Then the FDA did not hold any more advisory committee meetings and authorized the new booster from both companies on August 31st. The CDC Advisory Committee on Immunization Practice, or ACIP, held their meeting the next day and voted to recommend the bivalent vaccine for their respective age groups. And the CDC Director, Dr. Walensky, signed off the recommendation the same night. The whole process was extremely fast. So why is there such an urgency? What is the added benefit of fast-tracking the new booster without human clinical data? Let's first look at the personal benefits. According to the CDC presentation, it concluded that the benefits of bivalent vaccines increase immune response. The booster also further increases the high levels of protection against severe disease, now notice that the CDC recognized the rapid waning of protection against asymptomatic or mild disease. They made no claims on how well the updated booster can protect against mild disease and transmission in their conclusion slides. Even though the BA1 bivalent vaccines stimulate higher level of antibody production than the original booster, they do not know the incremental increase in vaccine effectiveness of the BA45 booster due to the lack of human clinical trial data. There is no available data to support the estimation of the new booster's duration of protection, although they think it may have longer duration. In a most recent PBS News interview with Dr. Fauci on September 2nd, he expressed that the benefits vary considerably depending upon one's risk. An elderly person or someone with an underlying condition would benefit more than a young, healthy person. I agree with Dr. Fauci's statement. The only catch is that currently there are no quantitative assessment of clinical benefits, which seems that the regulatory agency may have lowered the bar for these new boosters. Throughout the ACIP meeting, a few committee members voiced reservations about the BA45 bivalent vaccine due to the lack of human clinical data. CDC officials emphasized that the new booster is an extension of the COVID mRNA vaccine that have been used for more than two years, and there are extensive data collected regarding its safety and effectiveness. 
and the booster does not need human clinical data, just like how the annual flu vaccine are not tested in humans every year before it is marketed. The whole argument makes sense, but have we learned enough about the mRNA vaccine to apply the same annual flu vaccine principle to it? According to a review article written by a renowned American physician and vaccine expert, Dr. Stanley Plotkin, who also co-authored a vaccine book with Dr. Paul Offit, not all vaccine immune responses are correlated to the same degree of protection. He stated that in one of the six central principles, it is important to define protection against what. Correlates may differ quantitatively and qualitatively depending on whether the objective is to prevent systemic infection, mucosal infection, disease, or severe disease. During the early phase of the mRNA vaccine rollout, the vaccine goal was to prevent infection, but with waning immunity and virus mutation. The goals have changed to prevent severe disease and death. Until today, there is still no robust knowledge of how COVID vaccine antibody responses correlate to prevent disease or severe disease. While the bivalent vaccines have quantitatively shown a higher number of antibodies than the original vaccine, the true clinical impact remains unpredictable. Dr. Plotkin also stated that the literature on the correlates of protection against influenza is rich, but even with such extensive experience with inactivated flu vaccines, the young and the old have different degrees of correlation. And for instance, in adults up to about 50 years old, serum IgG antibodies correlate well with protection. But more compelling evidence suggests cytotoxic T cells and granzyme B production correlate better with protection than antibodies do in elderly. Both Moderna and Pfizer only presented antibody levels as their evidence of immunogenicity, and their evidence would be much more convincing if they could present cellular immunity data. It is baffling that companies with so many resources are still reluctant to release these data to the public. In addition, Pfizer's other bivalent vaccine trials in humans have only been conducted in people aged 18 and above. And based on our rich experience with seasonal flu vaccine, we know that there are age differences. Yet, the BA.4.5 bivalent vaccine received authorization. And recommendation for people as young as 12. Perhaps we could reasonably assume that the new vaccine is not likely to pose additional risk to these young people. But what are the bases for assessing the incremental benefit? However, we know myocarditis is a known risk for both COVID infection and COVID vaccination. A recent detailed analysis of nearly 43 million people was published on August 22 in the American Heart Association Journal Circulation, which is seven working days ahead of the FDA issuing EUA to the bivalent vaccines. In brief, this article concluded that in men under 40 years old. The risk of myocarditis after receiving the second dose of the Moderna vaccine is higher than in those infected with COVID. There are also uncertainty with sequential vaccine doses. In fact, Germany and France have restricted the use of Moderna vaccine in men under 30 years old, and Finland, Sweden, and Denmark also have similar age restriction in Moderna use for young males. Now, these restrictions were initiated in late 2021. It does not seem that the U.S. FDA and CDC have considered that option. Someone may argue that we could not directly compare European and American vaccine practices because our healthcare systems are very different. This is absolutely correct. American hospital stays are known to be the most expensive among developed countries. 
according to a published poster abstract in a 2019 American College of Cardiology meeting. The average hospital charge for myocarditis hospitalization stay was $110,568 in 2014, with an average length of stay of 7.4 days. While there are no publicly available similar data from European countries, a review article from Germany described the average hospitalization cost of the acute phase of myocardial infarction, commonly known as heart attack, which is a much more serious heart injury than myocarditis, to be only between six thousand seven hundred ninety and eight thousand nine hundred and nineteen euros. Per emission, even with the worst exchange rate for the U.S. dollars in 2014, an average heart attack hospital stay in Germany would only cost as much as 12,500 U.S. dollars, roughly ten times less than a myocarditis hospitalization stay in the U.S. Even though Germany has a much lower hospitalization stay cost than the U.S., they still choose on the cautionary side to protect their young males from rare vaccine injuries. Why have the U.S. regulatory bodies not taken that into consideration? When both the risk and incremental benefits of the new bivalent vaccine in young males are arguable. Even the cost-saving effect of COVID or COVID vaccine-related myocarditis prevention becomes questionable. So, what about public benefits? The main public benefit of giving the new bivalent vaccine early in September, before human data is available in November or December, is the potential additional hospitalization and death reduction by 137,000 and 9,700 cases, respectively, based on complex computer modeling prediction. In addition, the model also predicted that authorizing the new booster to 18 and above would lead to at least a 20% and 15% reduction in hospitalizations and deaths, respectively, versus a recommendation for individuals ages 50 and above only. Again, this model still omits the public benefits of authorizing and recommending for. All people age twelve to seventeen. If there's anything we have learned about the pandemic and the virus by this time, it is extremely difficult to make precise predictions due to its dynamic nature. I have also mistakenly been too optimistic about the end of the pandemic back in March in one of my videos, and I was wrong. A study was published in early 2021 to assess the reliability of COVID-19 modeling techniques. They suggested that some models were relatively accurate, while others were not. The longer the period covered by the model, the likely more accurate the estimate tends to be. Note that the CDC models are estimated until about April 2023. But do we absolutely need these new boosters to provide a public benefit? Why can't we use the old one with human clinical data? A new modeling study in a preprint, led by a mathematical modeler at the University of South Wales in Sydney, Australia, suggested that the differences between the original booster and variant-based booster appear to be very subtle, according to the study. It also suggested that even though boosters are more effective when they resemble the circulating variants, they add little extra protection when the population immunity is already high, which is the case in the U.S. with all prior vaccinations and infections. According to Dr. John Moore, a vaccine scientist at Weill Cornell Medicine in New York City. This is not some kind of super shield against infection compared to what you could have got two weeks ago or a month ago, and you may wonder what is the title all about. The CDC has relaxed most of the guidance for testing, distancing, and quarantine. 
It is betting on a higher uptake of the new bivalent vaccine to prevent the anticipated winter COVID surge. CDC's survey of 171 people showed that 72% of the respondents were willing to get an updated booster. My recent poll appears to have a very different result. Many respondents in the CDC survey believe protection from previous doses is enough, and an updated booster is not effective. Some are also worried about the side effects of the updated vaccine. It is in part likely due to a lack of human clinical data. Even though there were still plenty of monovalent COVID vaccine left, and with more than two years of effectiveness and safety data, the FDA decided to remove its authorization for individuals 12 years and up. At this point, the FDA and CDC have put everyone in a bivalent basket. Let's hope their bet on the bivalent vaccine is good enough to save the public, and not a misstep in wasting vaccine resources and eroding trust in the public. To wrap up, I would like to emphasize that the goal of this video is not to discourage you from taking the new bivalent booster. But to give you additional information and resources to assess your own risk, just like what the CDC wants everyone to do, it is up to you to decide if this glass is half full or half empty. That is all for this week, and I know this video is extremely long with a very heavy topic. And thanks for all of you who stayed until the end. And watched everything. I've spent a lot of time on reviewing, gathering all relevant studies. And if you think this video is helpful, please comment, share, and like so that more people can discover it. And I hope to see you again in my next video. Meanwhile, please stay safe, stay healthy, and take care. Bye.